All right. Okay. Good morning, everybody. We'll go ahead and begin as the bell has rung. Abba, Father, in Christ's name and your Holy Spirit, thank you so much for this day that you've given us, Father. And even on these, this breezy morning, as we're reminded, Lord, of your spirit moving upon us and over us. And Lord, we thank you of your constant presence with us. Holy Spirit, we ask that you be our rabbi today, that you would open your living word to us, empower us to see and understand, perceive what you're saying to us, empower us to live it in Christ. We praise you for all these things in the precious and powerful name of Yeshua. And in your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. This morning, I hope, my prayer is, and I believe it's in agreement with the Lord's will, to lift your hearts and to set you free. That's always the purpose of his word, to lift burdens, to bring freedom, and to simplify your theology possibly just a little bit today. We're going to begin in Genesis 3.8. We could spend the entire morning on this one verse. Obviously, we can't do this. Uh, This is when it all went off the rails for us as human beings. This is the, the breaking moment of that relationship after Adam and Eve have chosen to rebel against the Lord, have not trusted his heart, have gone the way of the Nahash, the one who deceived them into rebelling against the Lord. And now he's coming to them for the first time since they chose to rebel. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Of course, that's the ESV rendering. I think the complete Jewish Bible is a little better. Uh, They heard the voice of Adonai God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. So the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Adonai God among the trees in the garden. Well, a couple things I wanted to point out is, first of all, they heard the sound of the Lord God. The word sound, or sometimes translated voice, as you can see in the complete Jewish Bible, is the word kol, and it means a voice or sound of an instrument, a proclamation to sing, and it it carries the idea of lightness and frivolity. And so they're hearing the voice, the sound of God. There's a singing to it. There's a frivolity to it as God is entering the garden Hafach is that word, walking is certainly correct, but in this it, it means to come, and so he's entering in the garden. Garden is the word gan, and it means an enclosure, but it's also figuratively used for bride, a bride. And so what we see here is that God is coming with a, a heart of joy and singing, and it's a time of unity with Adam and Eve. It's a time of communion with them, a deep time of worship. And so what we can understand from this is up until this point, apparently there was a particular time of day when Adam and I would come and there would be a joyful unity with Adam and Eve and it would be a time of worship and and celebration. And so that's why he's coming into the garden at this time. So this is something that was um, a daily experience with them uh, and the Lord for them and the Lord. And so, uh, the word cool of the day is the ESV renders it really is not very good. Evening breeze is much better because the word in Hebrew is ruach, which is the same word as pneuma in the New Testament, and it means wind or breath or spirit. So the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Adonai God. Presence there is the word panim. We've talked about this word. It means the face, the presence, the countenance of a person, and this is used Uh, several times in scripture regarding the Lord, the panim of God, the presence of God, the the countenance of God. Remember Jacob wrestling with the panim of God in in, um, in a face-to-face time. And so the presence of God, and they they hid themselves among the trees. Now the word trees, there's the word eights, and it does literally mean a tree, but it also means gallows. In the book of Esther, eights is used to talk about the gallows. And this is profound to me because what we see here is up until this time, until sin entered the world and shame entered the world, 
there was a time of complete freedom. Adam and Eve knew that freedom. They knew no shame. And there was a time of, of worship and intimacy with God. And so he is coming to the garden to meet with them in a time of intimacy and worship. But what has happened? Well, sin has entered their hearts. And so instead of freedom and joy, as they hear his voice coming and calling for them as he's entering the garden, they respond with shame. And they go hide among the trees, which now had become a gallows to them because of shame and because of sin. So they were hiding from God's presence. Shame had entered the world and everything changed. And his presence is everything. Now we see in Exodus 33, 15 through 16, and he, being Moses, said to him, God, if your presence, if your panim will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. How shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? See, Moses understood that it's the panim, it's the presence of God, it's the face of God, the essence of God with them. That was the one distinction that he had as a human being, that they had as a people. Without the presence of God, they were no different, no better, no other than any other people on the face of the earth. His presence is everything. Remember, Jehovah means self-existent one. He is existence itself. And Moses understood this. And this is Abba in the process of restoring what was lost in the garden. It's a process of centuries. It's still going on today. Abba in Christ by Holy Spirit is in the process right now of correcting, healing what was lost in the garden. But in this, Moses understands it's all about his presence. It's all about intimacy with him. It's all about being with Jehovah. David understood this because he realized his presence is everything. His presence is the provision. His presence is the power. His presence is the protection. And when my enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before your presence. That's people who are in wrong relationship with Abba. They have no relationship. They have no intimacy. So his presence, it repels them. It pushes them back. But David also said in Psalm 1611, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. This is a restoration of what was lost in the garden. David, through his loyalty and his love for Abba, is being restored to the presence of God. And that's his desire. It's his heart's desire. He had a man after God's heart. He wasn't perfect. We know this. He had a lot of sin in his life, but he was loyal to God. He, was, he desired him. He wanted to be in his presence. That was his one thing. And that was a prayer. This, this one thing I ask, I desire to be in your temple, to be in your presence, constantly seeking your face. So his presence is everything. Moses understood this. David understood this. It's about the whom. It's not about the what. Sisters and brothers, 2 Timothy 1, 11 through 12, Paul said, I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher, which is why I suffer as I do, but I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced that he is able to guard into that day what he has entrusted or what has been entrusted to me. Until... Paul's life was forever changed by an encounter with Yeshua. He fiercely contended for the what of life. He contended for the dogma, the doctrine, the religion of the Jews. That's the what of it. And he thought that that was the factor that would qualify him as being right with God. But he came to understand that only the whom of it, Christ himself, can accomplish this. It's not the what of it, it's the whom of it. And that set him free because among the Jews, there wasn't anyone more religious than he. There wasn't anyone who was more all in than he. And he even said that. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. You, if you've ever met a Jew, here's the dude right here. He's the poster child for Judaism. He was the top of his class. 
He was the smartest guy in the school. He had the Torah memorized. He had, he had did all the stuff, the dogma, the doctrine, and it actually drove him to madness. It gave him a murderous spirit because he's actually attacking and killing the people or desiring to have the people killed who are following Yeshua, the person. So the what drove him to madness. It was the whom of it that set him free. Religion is witchcraft. Paul said that writing to the Galatians. We talked about that. Witchcraft controls, it limits, it binds. Any and all religion is witchcraft. Christ is freedom. And Paul came to understand this. It's the whom of it. It's not the what of it. But what happens is that the enemy practices witchcraft among us and gives us religion. And we buy into religion. Religion divides. It angers. It binds. It separates. And we see that in the body of Christ today, a subdivided body. Because Christ is divided? No, Paul said that. Is Christ divided? Absolutely not. But religion does that because it's the what of it. And the what of it, we'll, we, we'll be here until eternity ends discussing the what of it. And that is disagreement. But the whom of it, Yeshua, Jesus, he is our unity. And so when we focus upon him and loving him, he's the one who transforms us and brings us into unity and agreement with him. The whom of it, it's not the what of it. But there are those who chose the what instead of the whom. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. We talked about this last week. Mark 12, 28 through 30. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul with all your mind and all your strength. What was he doing? He was quoting the Shema. They all knew the Shema. And he simplified it. That's a completely relational word. You know, they had over 600 commands, not that God had given, but they had developed as Jews. They had added to the word of God. And they had made following Yahweh so complicated and so difficult that only the most intellectually elite and the most dogmatically committed could even begin to pretend to follow that way. And they're failing, though they're not admitting it to themselves on a daily basis. And in the time of Christ, as he's coming, they're, they're all talking, they're constantly, you know, what do you think that this means? What do you think that that means? No, that's not right. Moses was saying this. No, this is, you know, and it's just ah, every day. And Yeshua comes into the scene, and he's the whom of it. And they say, Rabbi, what is the most important? Because they're always arguing about what are the most important commandments. Well, if you get these 100 correct, then you've got it. Well, if you get these correct, well, this rabbi's right. That rabbi's right. The scribe said, Rabbi, what do you say? Yeshua just quotes the Shema. Hero Israel. The Lord our God is one. Love him with all your heart, your spirit, your soul, and your body. That's the Garden of Eden, spirit, soul, and body. Yeshua said, you get that, you got it. You don't have that, you don't have it. It's that simple. It's just that simple. And we see this as his disciples are growing in this understanding. In Mark 8, 29, he asked them, who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. Here's the test, my disciples. How many books of the Bible are there? How many times did Moses do this? How many times did Elijah say, no, that's not what he did. Who do you say I am? That's it. The whom of it. If you don't understand me, if you don't know me, if you don't love me, if we're not in right relationship, you've got nothing. You've got nothing. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, you're the Christ. You're a Mashiach, the anointed one. You're the one that was promised. 
We also see in Matthew 14, 28, we've talked about Peter understanding that, that personhood. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. Lord, if it's you, remember the story. They're in the storm. Christ comes to them, terrifies them, never seen this before, don't understand who he is, what he's doing. They actually misinterpret, think he's evil. Some, there's something very wrong with this picture. He's doing something new. But for Peter to work this thing out and for him to do what Christ is doing, he said, Lord, if it's you. He needed to know the whom of it. If it's you, I need to know if, if your identity. If this is you, then you command me to come on the water. And we know in Jeremiah 1.12 that the Lord watches over his word to perform it. So Peter just needed those two things. I need to know it's you, Lord, the whom of it. And I know that because you are the word, you watch over the word. So if you speak this word to me, you'll perform the word. You will do it. It's the person of it. It's the whom of it. And as long as I'm just agreeing with your word, I can walk on that word because you are that word and you will perform it. And that's all Pete needed. Now, this is a high point for him. He messed it up subsequent to that, like we all do. But this is a high point for him because he's getting it. You're the Christ. Who do you say that I am? You're the Christ. You're the one. It's the whom of it. You're the whom of it. You're the whom of it. When he's in trouble, when they're in distress, when there's chaos, when it's dark, when there's a storm, if it's you, command me. That's all he needed to know, the whom of it and the word. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, Hebrews 13, 8. So when you're confident in the whom of any given situation, you don't have to concern yourself with the how of it. You just need to know the whom of it. Yeshua is here. Whatever you find yourself in, wherever you are, whatever the question is, whatever the challenge is, the only thing you need to determine is the whom of it, and that's Christ. And he'll show you the how of it or the what of it. He will accomplish his word. And it's just that simple doesn't make it easy, but it's simple. It doesn't mean it's not difficult and hard situation, but it's simple. It's always simple. It's the whom of it. It's confidence in his identity, which never changes. And so our confidence does, never has to change. He's the object of our prepositions. For though there are some that are called gods, whether in heaven or in the earth, as there are many gods and many lords, but to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. I chose the Jubilee Bible there. It's, uh, it's a little clearer. The ESV says, for their so-called gods, and that's a little confusing. Paul's not saying that there aren't other spiritual beings. He's saying they're called that way. So-called to us in English sounds like, well, that's a so-called, meaning it's not really that. And so it doesn't translate very well, in my opinion, that way. The Jubilee is saying there are some called gods. And then he goes on to say, because there are other spiritual beings that are worshipped. So they, they do exist. But to us, there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. So the scriptures affirm that there are other spiritual beings that have power, and our worship is God, but Christ followers know there's only one true God, and that everything true originates and emanates from him. He is the of, in, by, all things eternal. He's the whom of it. So he's the object of all of our prepositions. He is our theology. You want, to, you want to pass with flying colors a theological test? What's your theology? If your answer is Yeshua, if it's Jesus, you got it. 100% you pass. And Paul's saying this in Colossians 1, 15 through 20. This is his, really his highest Christological statement. Here's this guy who was a Hebrew of Hebrews, who was a Jew of Jews, who had been through the system, and he narrows it down to him, the whom of it. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. He's talking about whether they're dark powers or powers of holiness. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he 
is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether in heaven or in earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. In Acts 17, 28, in him we live and move and have our being. Again, remember, Jehovah means self-existent one. And so you can't exist outside of God. In him we live and move and have our being. And there will be a time when those who are not in Christ will be thrown into the lake of fire, the, the eternal fire, meaning the type of fire that it is, and they'll be consumed. There'll be no more. Because they, you can't self-exist. You have to be of the same substance of God. You have to be homoousios. You have to be of God in Christ. And so all things return to him. If you're not in him, there will be a time when you cease to exist. Hell is a real place. It exists now, but remember the word tells us it's a holding cell for rebellious spirits until the day of judgment. But after that, how are you going to self-exist? If you're not in God, if you're not homoousios, if you're not of the same substance of God, how are you going to continue to exist? You can't. Evil is not going to continue to exist. So everything that is not of God and in God will not be no more. All things will be made new, the Lord said to us in Revelation. In him we live and move and have our being. Outside of him we cannot live, we cannot move, and we do not exist. He is our theology. It's just that simple. Intimacy is the only way. Because you have known me, you will also know my Father. From now on you do know him. In fact, you have seen him. And this is a complete Jewish Bible, 14.7 of John. Know is gnosko. We've talked about to learn, to come to know, get a knowledge of, to perceive, to feel, to become known, to understand. And it's the word used for physical intimacy between a husband and a wife. You know me. The whom of it. Seen is horao. It means to see with the eyes, to see with the mind, to perceive, to know, to become acquainted with by experience. See, no one can legitimately say he or she knows the Father without first knowing the Son. By truly knowing and seeing Christ guarantees knowing and seeing the Father. And again, I don't say this in a spirit of criticism or attack, but that's why we can know for a fact that anyone outside of Jesus Christ doesn't know God. It's not possible. It's absolutely categorically impossible. You do not know the Father. People say, well, you know, everybody worships the same God. No, you do not. <laughs> if you don't have intimacy with Jesus Christ, you don't know the Father. You've never seen him. You don't understand him. You have no relationship with him. It's not possible for you to have relationship with him. Because Christ and the Father are one. And he is the only access to God because he is God. Intimacy is the only way. No intimacy. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many righteous work, mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Gnosko. We never had intimacy. I never knew you. It's not possible to experience true intimacy with a religion. This can only be done between persons. You can practice religion all you want to. And you can even throw the name of Jesus around, which is what they're doing. And if they're having some success with casting out demons, it's because they're responding to the name of Jesus. They're not responding to those individuals. They say, didn't we throw your name around? Didn't we see some things happen? And Yeshua said, I never knew you. We were never one. We never had any intimacy. And so you, you had no desire to know me, so you don't know me, and so you can't be with me. And he doesn't say that out of joy. But that's how it is. There is a knowing. And by this we know, gnosko, and by this we know 
that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. Abide is the word meno, and it means to remain, abide, to continue to be present, to be held continually. The Holy Spirit is the person of Christ, and when you have a gnosko relationship with him, no one else has to tell you this is so. If you do have to wonder, then you have a religious relationship. Yeah, if you have to wonder, do I really know Jesus? Well, then you have a religious relationship, and he's calling you to something deeper. But nobody has to tell you, if you're married, nobody has to tell you if you've had intimacy with your spouse. <laughs> you don't have to wonder. Gee, I wonder. We've got four kids, so I'm thinking probably so. There's some fruit of that. You know, you know. Nobody, and, and, and Satan himself can't come and tell you, no, nah, that's not your spouse. No, you don't have any children with her or him. <laughs> well, that's how it is with Yeshua. Do you know him? Have you, have you walked with him? Is there fruit in your life? Satan can't tell me I don't know Yeshua. I don't have to sit there and wonder that. And that's the freedom because it's the whom of it. Now, Satan can trick me with theology. He's more intelligent than I am. I mean, if, if he wants to drag me off in the weeds and say, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? He, he could run circles around me and entangle my mind. And if I'm going to get off in doctrine and theology and I try to stay there and battle him with that, then eventually he's going to whip me because he'll wear me down. He'll, he'll trick me. He'll do something if it's just me and theology. When we talk about Yeshua, well, that's a whole different thing because he's everything. And I'm his little brother, and I know it. Because he paid the price for that. Receiving from heaven, John the Immerser answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it's given him from heaven. Mark 6, 2, and on Shabbat, on Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. We're homoousios. We're of the same substance. John 14, 10, do you not believe that I'm in the Father and the Father's in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Remember, Yeshua, Jesus, was fully human, just like you and me. Had a physical body like ours. He had a brain like ours. He had to learn and appropriate information exactly like we do. He didn't get any advantages on that. The difference was he never broke fellowship with Abba, the Holy Spirit. And so he was able to receive freely in an unfiltered way. But everything that he knew, he learned because he began the world and entered the world as a baby, and babies have to learn everything they know. And Christ had to learn everything he knew. He had to study the scripture for himself. He had to learn that's a goat, that's a dog, that's an ox, that's a tree. He had to learn the names for it, just like us. He had to learn his colors and his numbers, just like us. He didn't have any advantages over us in that. He was fully human. And so they're looking at this going, where is this guy getting this stuff? And he's saying, from my father, because we're one. I talk to him every day, all throughout the day. He teaches me, and I'm teaching you. And the ability to receive, when they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you're to speak or what you're to say, for, you, for what you're to say will be given to you in that hour. The word be given is didomi, and it means to give something to someone, bestow a gift, to give to one's advantage to grant, to give to one asking, to let have, to furnish, to supply necessary things, to deliver, to cause, to come forth, or to point to an office. See, if God is going to give you something, you have to be with him and close enough to take it. Thus, relationship, proximity, and willingness to agree with God are the qualifiers to receive from heaven. Relationship and proximity, that's, that's the thing. 
If you're not close enough to him, he can't give it to you. Close union makes the difference. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they, what, had been with Jesus. The word common there in Greek is idiotes. It's where we get our English word idiot. Now, they weren't idiots. They were, they were intelligent men. They were good businessmen. They had a very successful business. But they weren't scholars. They weren't great theologians. We know because they weren't in the rabbinic system, they at some point had been tapped out. And that's why they're doing something different. But they were still intelligent men. They weren't idiots in the, in the English rendering of it. But they were unlearned from a standpoint of the scholastic mindset of the Jews. They didn't have the degrees. They didn't have the pedigree. They didn't have any of that. And so the difference was they had been with a me means to be, exist, to happen, to be present. God is existence itself. They had been with existence itself. And so they exist in him. And because they have intimacy with him in relationship, then Holy Spirit is able to speak to these otherwise unlearned, ignorant, rude men. They're just common men. There's nothing special about them. Nothing that separates them from everybody else except Holy Spirit. And because they have intimacy with him, Holy Spirit is saying, hey, tell them this. And so they say it. Everybody's like, what? Where do you guys get this stuff? Well, they had been... And that with is soon, it's where we get our English sin together, S-Y-N, synthesis, or you apply that to various words. It's together with, beside. It's a primary preposition denoting close union by association. Companionship, it's process, and it's a resemblance. See, when you have close union with Yeshua by deep association, you're going to resemble him. You're going to start thinking like him. You're going to start speaking like him. You're going to start smelling like him. You're going to start looking like him. Because that's what that synthesis, that togetherness does. And we see that in our own personal lives, uh, members of a family. We have a language in my family. We have words that we've coined, we've made up that don't make sense to anybody else. But I can speak a word that I've made up or one of my children has used over the years, and it's just morphine language. Everybody in my family either will laugh about it or will know exactly what the other one is saying or thinking because we're unified, we're one as a family. We have our own language. And that's how it is with God. When you know Yeshua and Holy Spirit and Abba, there, you just have this thing by the Spirit. And he can show you a color, a number. You'll be out somewhere and you just know he's talking to you because you have that intimacy. Close union makes a difference. And Peter and John had it. They're, just, they're fishermen. They're just businessmen. And they're just blowing their minds with the theology that's coming out of their mouths. Access to the treasures. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So only those who have personal intimacy with Christ, the whom, will ever have access to the true treasures of wisdom and knowledge, the what because these are hidden in him. The only way you will ever have access to the treasures of God is in Christ, because they're hidden in him. Now, the enemy knows this, and that's why the enemy is trying to and does a very good job of throwing all these deceptions out there and, and trying to pull people in, and you know this is the secret knowledge, and this is our secret club, and if you join our group, and if you go to this, and if you practice this, then you're going to get this knowledge that nobody else has. Well, you're going to have something maybe nobody else has, but it's not good. But the true treasures of God are hidden in Christ, so the only way you'll ever have access to them is in him, being with him. Judgment and redemption. I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face. In their distress, earnestly seek me. 
This is Hosea 5.15, and the very next chapter picks up. The people are saying, come let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us that he may heal us. He has struck us down, and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up. That's prophetic. And that we may live before him. Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. His going out is sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. Judgment is being away from the presence of the Lord and redemption is being restored to his presence. Being away from the Lord is its own penalty and being with him is its own reward. Isaiah 62, 11 says his reward is with him. He is his own reward. So Abba withdrawing from his people is its own judgment. He doesn't have to do something to them. He just withdraws and it's his own penalty. It's its own judgment because they're not in his presence. They don't have him. And they come to recognize this. They come to their senses. Come, let us return to the Lord. The whom of it, the person of God, the presence of God is what we desire. Not the theology, not the doctrine, not the dogma, not the religion of it, the person of it. In God's heart, the Lord your God is among you, a warrior who saves. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will be quiet in his love. He will delight in you with singing. Zephaniah 3.17 now, this is the reversal. This is the healing of the Genesis passage we saw. When Abba is coming to the garden, his spirit is entering the garden to have communion, worship, intimacy with Adam and Eve. That's his heart's desire. That's why they were created. And this has been broken because they've chosen to rebel. But this, this is the answer to that. The Lord your God is among you, a warrior who saves he will rejoice over you with gladness. And you see three steps in this, and the Lord was showing me this just yesterday. He rejoices over you with gladness. This is an initial, when you say yes to him, there's a rejoicing in that. You think about that in your own life, for those of you who are walking with Christ. The day that you understood who he was and you said yes to him, it's different for everybody, but there was something in you that was joyful. There was something in you that you knew this was right. And there's a rejoicing in the heavenly realm. And that's the first element. He will, he will be quiet in his love. Some translate it and say he will quiet you in his love. But I'm convinced that the translations that render it, he will be quiet in his love are, are accurate. And this speaks of the fact that there, there's a process where the time when you're not hearing and sensing and seeing all of that. But that word also means to engrave or to plow. And so he's working in you. He's, he's developing you. There's intimacy going on, but there's a quietness to it. And this represents the times that you're not necessarily hearing or seeing him in the way that you did initially, or there's a, there's a quiet time. But that's still intimacy. Because when you really know someone, you don't have to be talking all the time. But he's working. And, and so there's a, a, a plowing, there's a developing, there's an engraving going on. But then we see the third thing. He will delight in you with singing. That, that's a climactic moment when he's accomplished what he's desiring to do in you. And this, this process will continue itself over and over in your life. You'll see this process in various ways that he's growing you and developing you in intimacy or, or, or wanting to accomplish something through you. Uh, I could spend more time on it, but we don't have time. Hebrews 12, 2, looking to Jesus, looking to whom? Jesus, Yeshua the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. See, he took that shame of Adam and Eve into himself so that he could heal it. And this speaks of the restoration of intimacy in the Garden of Eden. This is precisely what God was desiring with Adam and Eve when they chose to rebel and hide from him in shame. The deepest desire of his heart is to be one with us and this is his cause for rejoicing and singing. And finally this, always remember, God's truth lifts your heart. If you're sitting under teaching, if you're hearing things in your own spirit that are burdening you, bringing guilt into your life, 
then you're not hearing the Holy Spirit because he's a burden lifter. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Remember, the yoke of the rabbi is the sum total of his teaching, the weight of his teaching on the, on the student, on the disciple. And the other rabbis had heavy yokes. If you're going to follow this rabbi, well, you have to do this and this and this and this, and you have to study this, and you have to memorize this, and you have to walk a certain number of paces on this day. That's heavy. Yeshua said, my yoke's not heavy. My yoke lifts weight off of your life. Now, the Lord is the Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Eutheria. We talked about that last week. Galatians 5.1 is... is most accurately translated for the freedom, teotheria, the definite article, for the freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Remember, this was a Greek legal term for slaves who were being set free. For the freedom was a document that was accomplished in the temple of the God of their master, and that master was paying for their freedom, and it was documented in that temple. Now this former slave belonged to that God and was a free person and could never be enslaved by anyone else again. And that's what Paul is applying to Christ, and he is the ultimate freedom fighter. And we are brought, our names are recorded in the temple of God as sons and daughters of God. We belong to our God, and we can never be enslaved by anyone or anything else again. And that's what Christ came to do, is restore our freedom, to have intimacy with our Father in him by Holy Spirit, to be one with him, and to be what we were created to be. Abba, we thank you so much for your living word to us today. It's deep, it's powerful, it's explosive, it's freeing, and it brings a lightness to us. Holy Spirit, I pray protection and blessing on every heart in this room and everyone who may be listening elsewhere. Protect our hearts and mind from a spirit of religion, dogma, doctrine, the things that bind us and weigh us down. Teo Eutheria, for the freedom, Lord, you have set us free. We want to walk in that freedom with you. We want to be restored to what Adam and Eve had in the garden. That's why you came. And we thank you for this, Lord. You deserve it. You desire it. And we want to give that to you as a gift back to you in our love and appreciation. And it's in your name, Yeshua, and by your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Thank you all, and grace and peace to you.